Hello and welcome to my live. My name's Melissa Neal and I'm really excited to be joining you here on YouTube and it's great to do this live because belly fat is a massive, massive problem and it's probably one of the biggest questions that I get asked is how am I going to get rid of my belly fat and I've done quite a few videos on this. I have done, you know, I've written blogs about it, but it's really good if I can do a live because that gives you guys the opportunity to kind of ask questions, doesn't it? And just a little bit about me. So my name's Melissa Neal, and what I do is I help women over 40 lose body fat. And in that process, you're going to get in better health, aren't you? As well as losing body fat, it's about feeling better. It's about looking better and it's a bit about feeling better. And I, I get a great deal of pleasure from this YouTube channel, really helping women out. And I know I get a ton of comments and feedback. So thank you for that. That, um, you know, the information that I've given you has really, really helped you. And so for me, that's all I want. I just want to help you understand what it is you should be doing to lose body fat. And one of the biggest problems that we have is actually losing belly fat. So I'm going to kind of share the screen here with some kind of information. And you can see here, you're probably sort of wondering what qualifies me to talk about this. And it's actually a really good question. And, you know, something that I'm not able to always give the answer to. And what qualifies me to talk about this is I actually work with hundreds of women directly. Thousands of women go through my programs and I also work with my own body. And if you've watched any of my videos, you'll know that I made a ton of mistakes before I got things right. And in a way, for me, that's what qualifies me because I know because I did a lot of things wrong. So I know what doesn't work. And that's how I came about, you know, what does work for women over 40. And it is possible to get in fantastic shape if you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s or 80s. I've yet to come across somebody that watches my channel in their 80s or work with somebody in their 80s but you know it's absolutely possible it's really important to say it's not going to be easy it's going to be harder and tougher than when you were younger to get in in the shape in the, the kind of shape that maybe a 20 year old or a 30 year old is in but it is absolutely possible. It's going to take you a bit longer. So hello. Thank you for all your wonderful comments for people that are just joining. Hi, India. Hi, Laurie. Hi, Nessa. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Sue. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Lisa and Lisa. Lisa and Lisa. Thank you so much for joining. It is absolutely wonderful to have you on this live. It's a great privilege to me to be able to talk to you guys and talk about weight loss and talk about fat loss. And the other thing, as well as my own body, what qualifies me is I've actually worked with hundreds of women directly and thousands of women have been through my programme and one of the things that when they find that they're successful and the people that generally are successful at, the, at this are people that is consistent. So this lady here was consistent. But what they do find is that they actually manage to get their midsection down, which is why I've done with my own body. I didn't have, you know, five years ago when I started on this journey, I didn't have the midsection that I have now that you saw on the, the picture, I really found it a struggle to lose the belly fat. So although I lost weight, I didn't lose the fat in the right way. So I lost kind of scale weight and I kind of got that skinny fat by doing that. And so, you know, if you do it correctly, what will happen, like this lady here, is you'll lose fat around your midsection. And I just want to show you all different 
sizes and types of women. These women have either been through a program or directly working with me. This lady actually did my six week shred and that's the results she got. So, you know, you've got to say to yourself that although we put on this belly fat, it's absolutely possible to actually get your midsection down. This is a lady that actually lives near me and, and she bought my Lean and Strong program. And, and she, I've done a video about her. She did incredibly well. But you can see, wow, what a difference in a midsection. So it, that's what qualifies me to talk about this because I've actually had experience of working with women who are kind of very unhappy about this, this gain of weight around their midsection that happens for hormonal reasons. And I'm just going to, I'm going to talk about the reasons and do pop any questions in the question box, in the chat box. I will answer questions as I go along. I, I, um, you know, sometimes I lose my train of thought <laughs> and I can see my friend Kim Williams, who is an absolutely awesome fit lady. And she's also a very good friend of mine. So hi to Kim. I'll have to get you on for another on one of my lives, Kim, because it's very interesting. Kim's a very busy lady, but manages to fit in looking incredible. And she's in her late 40s. So she's a real inspiration to other women. She was an inspiration to me, actually, when I first met her. So um, it, it, she's one of these people that shows you what's possible if you put your mind to it. And it's going to be mostly about mindset. So I hope everyone's settled in now and you've joined and you're comfortable I'm probably going to take about an hour or so on this live because I want to give a good go at questions. I'm going to talk about belly fat and talk about why we have it. I'm going to talk about what we can do about it. And I'm going to do a bit on my programs that I run that are going to help you if you want to take this further. You can just listen to my advice and not take it further. Or if you want to take it further and have something a bit structured, I'm going to run you through some of the programs I offer. So why do we get belly fat? I'm talking about why do we get belly fat when we're over 40 and or perimenopausal, menopausal or postmenopausal. And it can actually happen before perimenopause. It happened to me before perimenopause, kind of in my 40s. Well, what's happening is, you guys, your hormones are reducing and your body is trying to make estrogen because in estrogen is one of the hormones that's depleting. And one of the things that happens, how our body works is to produce estrogen our body actually stores more fat around the midsection to try and produce this estrogen. So there's actually a medical reason. So never beat yourself up about it. You know, you read a lot of this stuff. There was a piece of research that came out last year that just basically said we are more sedentary at middle age. And that's why we've put on weight. That is absolutely not true because what they didn't talk about or investigate in this study is the impact of hormones and muscle depletion. So, you know, there's a medical reason that this is happening. So never kind of think it's your fault or, you know, we are going to have, we've been through a period of time. And I know a lot of women tell me this with the pandemic, where we have become a little bit more sedentary because many of us are working from home and perhaps not going out and about as much as we did. And so that can kind of make matters worse. But it's certainly not our fault if we're doing as if, like I was doing, I was doing the exact same things in my younger days where I managed to remain in, in pretty good shape. And I was doing it when I was older and it just wasn't working. And it's really frustrating, really frustrating. And I was actually trying so, so hard to look in good shape and it just wasn't working. And, you know, one of the things is that we can do the wrong things. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that could sort of can exasperate belly fat that you might not be aware of. If you've been on my other lives before and, you know, I've had several doctors on, 
Um, menopause doctors, they'll talk about this, but if you haven't, you'll, you'll not be aware of it. So too much processed foods, and I'm going to talk about chemicals as well, they can have an impact on our hormones. So this is what's changed when we're older. So when we're kind of in our 20s and, and you know, possibly in our 30s as well, a lot of coaches and trainers and dietitians will say to you, well, you can eat what you like as long as you're in a calorie deficit. And that is absolutely true. But that changes when we get older because our hormones come into play and our body becomes really bodies become really sensitive to certain kind of changes that are happening and um, certain things that we put into our body is really going to impact on our hormones. So firstly, there's things like chemicals and processed foods. So they're going to have an impact on our hormones and cause us to store more body fat. So it's really important to recognize that. And that's a difference from when you were younger, where you can just be in a calorie deficit that's burning more energy than you're putting in. And everything is fine. You know, everything is fine. You can lose weight. And you probably found if you're anything like me, you've lost weight pretty easily in your younger days. And it's suddenly become really difficult. And so these things these things that probably don't come into play as much when you're young, they suddenly become really important when you're older. The other thing is stress. And I know I have a very big USA audience. And I would say your lives are particularly stressful in the USA, perhaps more so than, than here in Europe. We, we do have stressful lives. But I believe that what's kind of expected of you guys in the workplace, you know, you don't have all that much annual holiday, um, you know, annual vacation, annual annual leave from work. You know, in Europe here, we it's quite normal to have 30 days annual leave from work. But I believe you get like two weeks, which is 10 days in the USA. And that's just one example, because it's really hard to de-stress if you're constantly at work all the time isn't it so it's something to recognize and I'm, I'm going to talk about this further and I've done quite a lot of videos in all honesty about this I'm not a stress expert you know but I will talk about I, I, I talk about the strategies that you can put in place but it's really important to recognize if you you sort of think oh I'm doing everything right but I'm just not shifting this body fat, but you're highly stressed. So your cortisol levels are up, you're highly stressed, cortisol has a massive impact on weight loss, then that could be the reason why. And I've, I've worked with women who, they've got two things going on, lack of sleep and stress, high stress levels. And so one of the things that you must look at before you actually look at your exercise and your eating, it's probably getting on top of this before you do anything else. I would advise that would be my advice because, you know, if you're not on top of this and you're really struggling to lose weight, it's, you know, important that you address it. And then the other thing is too much alcohol consumption. Now I'll hold my hands up. I'm completely teetotal, which I think has been for the last three years. So I try not to be in evangelical about it's like a born again Christian or somebody that's given up smoking. They can be quite annoying. But what I would say is treat alcohol as a treat. So that's, you know, you're not doing it daily, possibly not even weekly. Some people say to me, oh, well, you know, I drink at the weekends. I actually don't believe in cheat meals too much unless you're, you know, on, you know, you're trying to maintain your weight. Cheat meals and things like alcohol are not helpful because our bodies, again, it's one of those things that isn't great for our hormone balance. It causes more lack of sleep. Um, you know, it's high in sugar. It can make you, 
it can make you less disciplined around food. I know because I was a heavy drinker before I became too total. So it can make you less disciplined around food. So there's lots of reasons. And I'm, I'm telling you now, my life is so much better without alcohol. It's it's a million times better without alcohol in my life. So not, you know, I started off by thinking I'm just going to drink occasionally. And then I just fell into actually, I don't really feel like drinking at all. So my advice to you would be to stick to drinking occasionally. And that's going to serve you much, much better at this age in, in menopause. And there's plenty of research to show that it's just not helpful for menopausal women and the other thing is too much refined sugar now I say too much because you know you don't deny yourself any of these things because once you start denying and saying I can't ever have that thing ever again whether it's refined sugar or alcohol then that makes it really difficult to stick to doesn't it but if you can say to yourself well I'm just going to keep those to a minimum because I know it doesn't serve me that well anymore and unfortunately sugar can feel quite addictive can't it then it's going to work really well but you know I do love and I eat myself most days a bit of dark chocolate but that's very very low in sugar compared to other kinds of um you know sweet treats that you can have so if that's you and you sort of think oh I've got a bit of a sweet tooth have one square of dark chocolate 70 percent cocoa dark chocolate it's got loads of things that are actually really good for you, good for hormone balancing. So that's kind of my tip there. So hello, if you're just joining and welcome, welcome to my live. I really, you know, appreciate all of you coming onto this live because I know it's daytime for some of you, isn't it? It's 8 p.m. Or, or actually 17 minutes past 8 p.m. here in the UK. Um, so, yeah. It's really, really, you know, I do appreciate this. And if you're joining and you haven't seen the beginning, you know, this will go up as recording. So I'm just going to quickly take a question here because it's always I haven't even read the whole thing. So hi, Emily. Really lovely to meet you. And thank you for joining. I hope you're still there and waiting patiently. I just saw the 1200 calories out of the corner of my eye. So I thought I'd put this up and see what it's all about. So Emily says, I have a pattern of restricting under 1200 calories and then binging like mad. You have helped so much with your recommendations to not restricting too much to keep me from binging. That is absolutely fantastic. I love that. So you, you see, this is the thing that happened to me. And I talked about it on one of my videos. I went, I took my calories too low. And then what happened is I ended up kind of binge eating, cheat days, binge in eating, and then you kind of undo everything you, you've done. And so the trick is that Emily's learned is to have your calories up as high as possible and have some sort of steady weight loss but it's sustainable so you can be consistent over time and stop binging because you feel satisfied. So today I feel satisfied. I'm actually going to, I'm going into a fat loss phase, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of what's called a cutting phase and I kind of been on maintenance for a little bit. And you know, I don't feel particularly hungry because I'm not taking my calories ridiculously low. And that's so important if you want to have sustainable weight loss and do it, for, you know, do it for good. Take the weight off, take the body fat off and keep it off for good. So I'm not about. Um, thank you, Emily. I'm not about quick fix diets. I'm all about doing something that's healthy, sustainable. You're going to be able to stick to it in the long term. That's what I'm about. And, um, you know, I just like to stick to those principles with my channel and be honest and, and open with people about that and it's going to take a bit longer but what the benefit of that is is you're going to be able to kind of um you know take the weight off which is what I did and keep it off for good take the body fat off you know I'm a competitor so I'm not always as lean as I 
I'm in, you know, I'm not in stage condition at the moment, but I'm still pretty lean for a woman, woman my age and eating enough that I feel satisfied. So going back to belly fat, what do we do about the, the diet? That's the biggest thing that people find, you know, they have a problem with and they don't know what to do. It's really hard because there's so much information. You know, before I started this channel and I was working on my own body, I found there was just so much information. It was really, really challenging to understand what we should be doing. And so this is, you know, I'm kind of setting it out in a very basic way here. So the first thing is I talked about on the previous slide about the chemicals and the processed foods. So what we need to be thinking about at this age is trying predominantly to eat a healthy whole foods diet. So that's kind of your fresh veggies or it could be frozen as well, frozen or fresh veggies frozen or fresh fruit and the kinds of kind of meat and, and fish and everything that you eat meat fish always go for stuff that's not been tampered too much by man or people so what I mean by that rather than having a chicken nugget have a chicken breast or a chicken thigh rather than having a sausage have a piece of pork so it's like that. So the less that it's been tampered with by people, the better. And we can't avoid processed foods altogether because they're in daily lives. So if you're going to have like a slice of whole grain bread, you might argue that that's processed, isn't it? So then, but just try and avoid the processing and the chemicals as much as possible because your body is going to thank you for that. And then just try and go for whole grains. So I don't mean never eat a slice of white bread ever, unless you're sort of, um, you know, you've got type 2 diabetes or maybe you're a bit insulin resistant. White bread's not a good idea. But just try and stick to mainly whole grains. So that's, we call it oats or oatmeal in the USA. That's rice, brown rice is better, it's kind of quinoa, it's whole grain breads, it's whole grain pastas, that kind of thing. You know, it's going to be, it's going to keep you fuller for longer and it's been less processed. So that's the food side of things. Um, and there you go. These, it's just really important to keep them to a minimum as I've said before because you know just keep them to occasions and your body is going to really thank you for it you'll feel more energized you know when I work with women and they start eating my meal plans and they start eating the fresh fruit and vegetables and they start eating the kind of the carbs that are the sort of whole grain carbohydrates they actually find they have more energy it's something that comes up time and again when I'm working with women. They, they find that it's not only the fat loss that's going to help you. It's, you know, and it, it's actually the exercise as well as, as well as the diet. It's the increased energy levels. And you know how hard it is, isn't it? At this age with your energy. I know I have energy dips all the time. Right, let me just put up this, this, this is really, really common. So hi, Joanne Rana, thank you so much for joining and welcome. And uh, welcome to my channel. If you're, if you're a follower of mine, that is absolutely fantastic. You say, you, I've just turned 50 and perimenopausal and my midsection has become huge. I can't seem to get rid of it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm talking through now. So we've just covered about the nutrition and um, I'm going to talk you through the kind of exercise that's really going to help with your midsection. But Joanne, just don't give up hope. I was where you are and many women that I've worked with are where you are. As I said earlier, it's not your fault. It's a medical reason that this is happening. But you can give yourself every opportunity to really reduce that midsection and start to feel a bit better about yourself. And it is absolutely possible. 
So I'm going to give, I'm going to talk about the exercise. So I talked about the nutrition. The other thing to mention about nutrition is always kind of take your protein high. So think about having around about one gram of protein for your every pound in body weight. So if you're like 150 pound woman, have 150 grams of protein. But if you're over 170 pounds, you don't have to have quite that amount of protein because it's kind of based loosely on lean body mass. So go for your goal body weight if you're over 170 pounds. And, um, you know, you 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 increasing your protein. I can do another live on that if, if that's of interest to people on how to do that. But it just means getting protein at every single meal and snack. And you can actually, I do have a free nutrition guide with a meal plan that's on my website that you can download for absolutely free. It's a PDF document. So do make use of that because that really takes you through everything that you need to know as a woman over 40 about nutrition. And um, it's, it's really comprehensive, actually, you know, it's free, and it's really comprehensive. So in terms of exercise, and you would have seen if you were at the start, I showed some pictures of women that have either been on my programs or worked with as a coach and how they got their midsection down through nutrition and then this type of exercise. So what we're talking about is strength training. And strength training is really fantastic for helping you build your metabolism when you're female and over 40. Coincidentally, it actually works really well for men. And I get a lot of comments on my YouTube videos from men saying this is exactly what men need to be doing. So if you've got a partner and you're thinking, oh, let's get we could go and work out together, a male partner, then um that would work really well because they should be doing the same thing. And um, strength training, if you're new to it, um, I do have a beginner's program. I'm going to talk about that at the end. Don't be frightened of it. And my recommendation is don't step to step into a gym if you're new to strength training. Actually do some workouts from home. And I've got some videos. I've actually got a beginner's workout strength training video on this channel. So don't fear it and don't sort of think, oh, I've got to go in the gym and go and be with all those kind of young muscular men hanging out. And I feel intimidated because you can absolutely do it from home. And all my actual programs and my app they all feature home workouts some of them also have the option of gym workouts but every single program that I have is like home workouts so you absolutely can do it that there, there is what I would say is depending on how good your equipment is at home after a few years there will be a limitation to how much you can progress with home equipment unless you've got very good home equipment but if you you know in your first sort of two to three years, you can definitely get by by doing all your kind of strength training from home without, you know, just some dumbbells, dumbbells, a, a kettlebell. I don't have much here at my home. And, you know, through the pandemic, I've had to work out at home quite a bit. I don't have much equipment. You don't have to spend a, money, a lot of money, just resistance bands. And, you know, just a few dumbbells, maybe one or two sets of dumbbells to start off with. And you can sort of build up from there. And strength training is absolutely fantastic for building your metabolism when you're over 40. Because what's happened is we've lost muscle mass as a rate of just under 1% per year after the age of 40. So if you think about it, between the age of 40 and the age of 60, you could have lost nearly 20 percent of your muscle mass. That's quite significant, isn't it? And that's one of the reasons that we gain fat around the midsection, because we've lost muscle. So what we need to do is actually just build the muscle up that we've lost through the aging process. And it's not going to get, you know, you're not going to get big and bulky by by doing this. You know, I have to 
if you've seen that I've got, you know, quite a significant muscle mass on my legs, particularly my quad, I worked really hard and went into a calorie, what's called a calorie surplus. So that's eating more than you need to actually, you know, deliberately put some muscle mass on your legs. So if you're in a deficit or in your maintenance calories, you're not going to get big and bulky. You know, some of us will have areas that will increase in muscle mass more than others so for me I find it easier to increase my muscle mass on my legs and but everyone's different some people it might be your shoulders or whatever it is you're going to have some points that are just going to increase in muscle mass but for a woman over 40 and over 50 and over 60 it's actually really hard to get bulky naturally and a lot of women that you see that are bulky they've either done it over many many years I mean they've been training for years and years you know potentially 10 years that kind of thing or they've taken performance enhancing drugs to get like that so you know don't be afraid of it and for most of you you're just going to be putting the muscle on that you've lost a bit through the aging process and it's like it's like people call it getting toned that sort of look that's all it is you know, it's not going to make you huge like some of these women, the, the female competitors that are absolutely huge. Even I can't get absolutely huge, you know, and I, I put a lot of effort and time into it. And so with the strength training, what's going to happen? It's not about what you do while you're strength training. It's more about what happens when you're resting to your body. So what happens while you're strength training is you're going to be lifting the weights. You're going to be kind of um, exercising the muscle, you know, and, and you're, you're trying to sort of do something called hypertrophy, which is actually getting your muscle breaking down and then building. And, and so what's going to happen is yes, you're going to burn some calories while you're working out. But what the really important thing for us at this age is going to help you burn more calories while you're just sitting around and you're resting when you're not doing anything. And that is the key for, for breaking this rut that you're in with your metabolism. It will really help. It means that you're going to eat, you're going to be able to eat more, you're going to be, feel satisfied and you're, bur you're going to be burning calories. So that's really good news, isn't it, that we can actually do something about our metabolism. We don't just have to let it sit back and happen to us. We can change our body shape and actually do something about that midsection. And with strength training, by the way, while you're working your core all the time, so if you're squatting correctly, and I always like women to do what I call compound movements. So they're movements that use multiple muscle groups. So that's like your squats, your deadlifts. So those are kind of hinging movements, really. You squats, your deadlifts, your pull movements. So pull downs, pull ups, that kind of thing. And then your push movements. So your chest presses, your shoulder presses. All these big movements, and it doesn't matter whether it's dumbbells or barbells or a machine, it doesn't really matter. Um, they're going to really, really help with your metabolism. And that's going to help you sort of burn fat around the midsection. And it's really, really important to get the technique right. So that's something that you need to work on and particularly this age so what can happen is we can have real problems do you have problems with your joints you know I have problems with my joints mine it's my hips and my back many of you will have problems with your knees and what you need to do is protect your joints at this age so it's not about although I say lift heavy it's lifting within your range. And I know I get asked a lot of questions. Well, how heavy should I go? And that's actually not an answer I can give because everybody's different. Even if you're a beginner, some beginners are going to be stronger than other beginners. And some people that are intermediate 
are, are sort of stronger than others and some people have stronger so my lower body is stronger than my upper body that kind of thing so it's really impossible to say to someone this is the weight that you should be lifting but what you should feel when you're lifting is you get in the really good form you don't speed up, you don't perform the exercise really, really overly quickly. So you should be counting for at least a second each way. So if you're going, doing a squat, count for a second down, count for a second up, and you can even do it much slower than that. And working towards really good form, because that's going to protect your joints. And then when you're getting your form right, you can start to go heavier, but go heavier in small increments. Don't try to be a hero. That's what I say to my partner when I work out with him, because he has problems with his knees and also his back. So I say, don't try to be a hero. Get the form. So work really hard on getting the form right. You can watch lots of videos. You can watch my videos here on YouTube. And I've done loads on strength training for fat loss. So have a look at those. And that's going to be key at this age to protecting your joints. And then, you know, and as I said, you are going to be working your core. So the strength training, that's going to build your metabolism. And the high intensity interval training is fantastic because what we don't want to be doing at this age is a ton of cardio. And this is what I see happens. It's a knee jerk reaction. I did it as well a ton of cardio you know I thought well, you know well running worked in my younger days so I'm going to carry on and do it and it, it didn't work and we don't want our bodies to be under that pressure all the time with hours and hours of cardio so I like short bursts of intense activity and so what you need to do with your hit your high intensity interval training is 20 to 30 seconds of very intense activity and then between 20 seconds to up to two minutes of resting or walking pace. And you can do that. Usually I recommend for between 15 and 30 minutes for you guys. And you wouldn't believe it, would you? You can fit that into 15 minutes. You can do it after your strength training. You can do it on a piece of equipment. You can do a low impact piece of equipment like stationary bike and electrical if you want to protect your joints again a rowing machine that kind of thing or you can do high intensity interval training workouts and again they can be low impact I've got low impact hit workouts on this channel and they can be high impact they can be you know I like to jump around and do high impact stuff not everyone can so you can do low impact and that's going to really help you burn fat without putting pressure on your body for long periods of time and actually break your muscle down because too much cardio so people like marathon runners and I always get like a lot of negative comments when I when I talk about this on my videos from marathon runners they don't like me at all but, you know, that is not going to do you any favours with body fat. You might enjoy it. You might absolutely love it. And if you're not interested in losing weight, then fine. Do your long distance running. Do your hours and hours of cardio. But if you are interested in losing weight, I would limit your cardio to up to 30 minutes, three or four times a week. You know, because you're not going to be able to gain muscle when you're doing a ton of cardio. So that's why I recommend HIIT because it's short bursts of high in, intense activity. And the North American Menopause Society did a study on this quite recently in 2019, where they used a group of women that did HIIT and they used a group of women that did steady state cardio. Then they had a control group. And the women that did the hit, they found it was perfectly safe because people say, oh, you know, it raises your cortisol level. So it's really bad for you. But you're doing this for short, very short periods of time. The time that you're actually active in hit, if you're doing 30 seconds on and say 30 seconds off, sometimes I do a minute or two off. The time that you're active could be five minutes, could be 10 minutes where you're actually active. So it's not huge amounts. And that's why it's really good for menopausal women, because we're not talking about huge amounts of like high impact, high intensity stuff. It's short bursts. 
And so the cortisol, yes, your cortisol does get raised, but actually in this way, it's normal for most women, unless you've got adrenal fatigue, that this that this is actually quite healthy. My cardio fitness is absolutely fantastic. You know, at this age, I would say I'm probably the fittest I've ever been. I don't do a lot of steady state cardio. I go out walking. I'm going to have the steps in a minute. But what I do is hit high intensity interval training. And it really has brought my fitness on tremendously. So, you know, it's going to make your heart health really good reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, all that kind of thing. In fact, everything that I've been talking about is going to benefit your health as well as losing belly fat. And by the way, if you're losing belly fat, you're going to be in better health because, you know, belly fat is an indication of visceral fat, which, you know, that's fat around our organs, which is, is, is not good for our health. So if we're losing belly fat, we're just going to be in so much better health and, and, you know, increasing our chances of longevity later on in life. If we're going to get, if we can sort of get rid of this belly fat. And then the other thing I recommended is planks. You don't have to do a massive amount three or four times a week, just, um, you know, and planks. people worry about this if they've got diastasis recti I've got diastasis recti, I do planks, because, you know, when you do a plank, you're actually kind of bracing everything in, so it's just important to brace everything in. I don't do a ton of sit-ups anymore or um, leg raises much, I just stick to the planks, because, you know, I've had a C-section, I've had diastasis recti, I just stick to planks and what that's going to do is it's really going to strengthen your core so when you're going to be losing the body fat you're going to reveal like a nice shapely waistline so it's really going to help with that but you've got to combine that with diet and the exercise it, it's this core work alone just doesn't do anything unless you're combining things with with diet and exercise and then lastly and this this is something it's steps and you know it's really funny because I was talking to a lady that was on my one in my challenge that I'm doing the belly fat boot camp challenge and she was saying oh you know I'm going to get my steps in because I've recommended she does 7,000 steps you know if you're not doing anything at all at the moment in terms of you, you know you're quite sedentary don't go up to 10,000 steps, just start off with something more manageable, even 5,000 steps. Or, you know, if you're not getting in any steps, if 3,000 steps even. But what she was talking about was getting on the treadmill. And I said to her, well, no, you need to fit it into your daily life. Getting on the treadmill is just a psychological thing of having to do one other thing as well as your strength training is in your hit. So I would say the way to sort of think about steps and getting steps in and it's just about being more mobile really just moving more moving more is going to burn more calories and then burning more calories is going to help you lose belly fat and the way to think about that is just building it into your daily life so if you're going to a supermarket shop park further away if you're going to a shopping mall park further away if you work in an office with a tall building take the stairs don't go on the lift if you work from home yeah go out for a short stroll at lunchtime or maybe while you're on a zoom call I know people that do this they're on the zoom call and they they go out for a little stroll but getting on another piece of equipment is just not it's not the way to think about getting in your steps because you can actually get in steps by doing housework or gardening, that kind of thing, dancing around your kitchen. You know, I like to actually go out dancing and, you know, I get my I get an enormous amount of steps in when I go out dancing, but it doesn't feel like exercise at all. So that's the way to think about getting steps in. It's not like another task that you've got to kind of think, well, when am I going to fit that in? Try and fit it into your daily lives. And some of you watching this, you're going to have a job maybe where you're already getting a ton of steps in because, you know, I know people like teachers, healthcare workers, 
um, people that work in the, the, the military or the police service, the emergency services, you know, anything like that. And even I, I know I've worked with people that work in prisons. You, you're going to be getting a lot of steps in anyway. So you might not need to worry about this too much. You might be just thinking, right, I've got to get my um, I've got to get in my hit and my strength training. So I'm still talking about belly fat. If you're just joining, hello and welcome. And thank you so much for joining. I do appreciate it. And, and I do appreciate you. If you're in the middle of work or something, if you've managed to duck out and, and join me, or perhaps you're working at your desk and you've got your phone, the video on in the background and you're, you're listening. So I do appreciate that. So, yes, actually, before I cover this, I'm going to take some questions again. So let's let's look because I, I, I haven't read this all the way through, but um, it looks good to me, Michelle. So, Michelle, hello and welcome. Welcome to my live. I hope you are well. I don't know where you are in the world, but thank you so much for joining and thank you for your question. And, and thank you for being patient and hanging on, really, because, you know, I know you, you, you're you all asking questions. So it's, you know, you might have to wait a little while. Sometimes I can't answer all the questions. But this might be a question that lots of you have. Michelle says, really would love some how ideas on how to get more ENT. Oh, I don't know what ENT is. Maybe that's exercise. Just always so tired, even though working out at Gym Ford. Oh, energy, which then impacts on motivation to work. Yeah, work out. This is a biggie, Michelle, because I feel you. Because at this age, do you have a lack of energy? I say, first off, it's really important to listen to your body at this age. So, don't work through if you're feeling really crappy and just absolutely exhausted, you know, on a particular day. And perhaps you're feeling really crappy and exhausted every day. You might need to address the things here first before you go down the route of exercise. But don't go. Don't go and do a workout. This is what I've learned with my own body. Don't go and do a workout because you're not going to get anything out of it if you're so tired and you know, I've been watching a lot of stuff where they're telling women about the menstrual cycle and maybe leaving out, working out at some, you know, if you're lucky enough to still be getting a menstrual cycle, leaving out, working out at certain days of the month, because that can be really, really tiring. So perhaps like the first day of your menstrual cycle or maybe pre your menstrual cycle. I know it's quite a lot harder to lift heavy during your menstrual cycle, for example, and maybe you can't push yourself as hard as well with the high intensity interval training. But it's very similar for women in menopause. So even if you're not getting a menstrual cycle, you're going to be feeling really tired. And there's a medical reason for this. You, you know, you're going to have days where you're absolutely exhausted and it might not look like it in my videos, but I have those days. I have those days and I'm learning, still learning about my body. And one of the things I've been learning is that I don't overdo it. I don't overdo it. So if, you know, I did it this week, I talked about it on a live I did on Instagram yesterday you know, Thursday, I sort of got up and I was kind of like, I think I need a rest day. No working out. I did go for a walk. And that that's going to really help your body. So sometimes at this age, less is more. You might need to cut down your workout days to three days a week. You know, and that that is good, because if you can do three days a week, but you can do three days and you can do that consistently over time, that's better than kind of doing five days and stopping and then starting again. So just think about that. And I know women that have got a thyroid issue, for example, um, and I've had a, a thyroid expert on this channel, live on this channel. She actually talks about people with, you know, hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's cutting down to two strength deck training days per week. 
So it's always about listening to your body and not pushing through. Sometimes it's better not to push through if you've got a real lack of energy, because what you actually need is rest. And that's really important. I've got it up here on this slide. It's really important at this age and we shouldn't kind of underestimate it. And we're not being lazy. You know, I've got a really good friend who was so active, so active in her 30s and 40s. And when she got into her 50s, going through menopause, she stopped exercise altogether. She just didn't feel motivated. And she's the least lazy person I know. So, you know, it's a struggle. It is a struggle. We're not, it's getting better because now we're being advised and, and we're getting information. And I know here in the UK, there's a big movement about menopause and, and, and women's rights around menopause. But prior to now, people didn't really talk about it. And so you might feel guilty if you have to go off and have a sleep during the day which I do from time to time I actually have a have a kind of half an hour to an hour sleep in the daytime to sort of just get some rest and recovery now I'm lucky enough to do that I run my own business and I can choose what I do when to do what I like basically but it's not being lazy it's because our bodies need that rest time and that's really really important so Michelle just sort of think about that and the other thing is for many of us and I find this fitting in working out if you can before work is probably going to be better in terms of your energy levels for most of us than trying to do it after work but that's not always possible for everyone and I completely recognize that and then looking at these things that I'm going to talk about on this slide, Michelle. So really working on your sleep. So it, it's sleep is the most difficult thing at this age, isn't it? And I completely understand. And, you know, sometimes I put these short video clips on and then I say the thing we need to be doing at this age is having some strategies in place to get more sleep. And then people get really angry because they say, well, I can't get more sleep. And of course, that's the same. It's exactly the same for me. I find it really difficult. If you've watched any of my videos about my hormone replacement therapy journey, you'll know that I was waking up with night sweats back last year, September, October. Mm, I think it even started about August, but I was waking up five or six times in the night absolutely soaking wet so you can imagine sleep was pretty difficult and it wasn't the easiest before then either so I was kind of in the throes of, of menopause and I've actually started taking HRT and it's like way better now my sleep's way better and my night sweats have completely disappeared through taking hormone replacement therapy we're lucky enough in the UK that it's probably quite easy for most of us to get hormone replacement therapy. I know in the USA, I get loads of comments from women who say it's really difficult to, to get that. And, you know, I'm not I'm not advertising HRT, but I just think that it might be something you need to consider if you're you've got a really poor quality of life because of your um menopause symptoms so it's just one to consider but the other ways of getting getting better night's sleep is actually going to bed and getting up at the same time there's loads of research that says this is a good thing I know that's difficult if you do shift work probably impossible if you do shift work um it's having like a sleep routine when you go to bed so you're giving your body the cues that it's like sleep time so it could be a bath, but if you get night sweats, that's probably not possible. Kind of lighting a candle, particularly like a lavender scented candle, dimming the lights, making your bedroom a cool, calming environment, free of clutter, that kind of thing. And then you can look at supplements. So the the doctor that I had, um, Dr. Natasha Ryan, what she I've had her on this channel. Um 
think it's a couple of times now I've had her on Instagram and on YouTube and she recommends L-theanine which is an amino acid and then ashwagandha and ashwagandha is actually really helpful for stress as well I take ashwagandha and L-theanine on her recommendation I found it to be really really helpful um, and then you can look at melatonin and valerian root as well for getting better sleep so it's something that it's not going to come easy. And we do need to sort of think about the tech side of things and sleep. So one of the things that a lot of people recommend is removing kind of like your smartphone completely from your bedroom and putting it somewhere in the house when you, you go to bed. If you have to have it there, have it face down, have the notifications off. Don't go on on your smartphone or any kind of close screen time an hour before bed is always a good thing, because even if you drop off to sleep easily, it can still make it stimulating and make you wake up later and then find it really difficult to go back to sleep, which is what most of us suffer from. So it's something that you you can do your own research and, and look at like different sleep strategies. It's not something that's going to be easy but it's worth the investment on spending some time actually being a bit mindful of improving your sleep. And you can improve it. Mine was dreadful and I did improve it, you know, and you can improve it if you put your mind to it. But if you were the next thing down and you're really stressed about something, it might be difficult. So you may have to deal with your stress levels as well. And of course, we can get highly stressed as well at this age because of going through menopause. Just going through menopause, it affects our so it affects us physically and it affects us emotionally and mentally. So we can become very emotional, very irrational, very angry mood swings. And all this kind of builds up, doesn't it, into kind of stress. So it's about looking at sort of stress techniques. So on the lower end of that, that's like maybe some mindfulness, listening to kind of de-stressing audios. And on the higher end of that, that might actually be seeking professional help to deal with your stress because it's just become too much and you need outside help to kind of help you with it. And I'm still talking about belly fat, by the way. This is all about belly fat. It's connected. And the doctor that I had onto this channel will say the same thing. She says the same thing about these things that I'm talking about on this slide. It, it's not that I'm being unusual. It's just that it's not talked about for women in this age group enough that these are these are the areas that we need to look at in terms of reducing our belly fat. Now, a big one as well that we can have a massive problem with at this age is gut health. And I know personally, I'm having issues with my gut health. And, you know, it's really going to help with your belly fat if you can kind of get on top of this. Because what if you've got poor gut health, what happens is it causes lots of inflammation in your body. So and that's a problem because, we, you know, inflammation is going to lead to more body fat, storing more belly fat. So that's the long and short of it. So it's really important to get on top of it and, and try and address it. If you know if your gut health is poor, so you could find you've got things like diarrhea or you've got conversely constipation. And you're having a problem when you're eating certain foods, you just can't digest it well. And the biggest culprits for this, so I've talked to my scientist buddy about this, and the biggest culprits are generally dairy and gluten. So if you if there's a possibility that you've got a food intolerance, you know you're eating certain things and it's it's just triggering a reaction it's worth looking at dairy and gluten first because they could be the problem areas. You can also get tested. You can get a test, um, really reasonably priced, a food intolerance test. But we are going to have gut health issues. It's really common at this age. And, you know, I was a person, I, I found, 
I didn't have gut health ever until about 18 months ago. I would say I'd have the constitution of an ox. I was really okay. My st stomach was absolutely fine. But this is the, the hormone imbalances going on is, is actually causing this. So it's definitely worth you looking at that. Um, oh, Laura's just asked me what about gut health would I recommend? And and so, yeah, and somebody, Tams, has just put apple cider vinegar. So, yeah, that's really good. Apple cider vinegar. I'm not a great believer in it for weight loss, in all honesty. I know you get loads of YouTubers, don't you, that say they've they've had this miracle weight loss with apple cider vinegar. I, I'm not convinced about that. And then any kind of fermented foods are really, really good um so sauerkraut is one kombucha which is a, a an, an asian drink so any of those fermented foods that they're really really helpful for gut health and then taking a probiotic probiotics really gonna help um and i actually advise and take myself now a digestive enzyme you can get all these on Amazon, really, a digestive enzyme. So I take probiotic, you know, you just take that daily whenever. And then the digestive enzyme, it's a good idea to take it just before you eat. And those have been a bit of a game changer for me, actually, digestive enzymes. So, yeah, and, and Lisa says there she eats yogurt. Yogurt can be really helpful, although if you've got dairy intolerance, like I can't eat yogurt it really does um it doesn't do me any favors yogurt which is a shame because i absolutely love greek yogurt is a fantastic source of protein but um for some of us it's not gonna it's not gonna work but great as in you know it's another thing that's like a probiotic isn't it yogurt so that's a really good good um comment lisa so and then if the the other thing about lifestyle and belly fat, it's actually getting enough rest. And I've just talked about this because there was a question about rest and, list, you know, kind of listening to your body. Don't work out every day. You know, if you're having, as I said, if you're having an off day, just don't work out at all because you're probably not going to get any benefit from it. If you're having if you're feeling really, really tired and under the weather, the best thing for your body is to take some rest. And, you know, we are in danger if we kind of overtrain and diet too hard, I'd like to say. So really low calories, overtraining. We are in, da in danger of getting things like adrenal fatigue, which, you know, then that's really difficult to deal with and come back. And you don't want to be in that position, which is why I'm such a big fan of kind of fueling your body correctly not being hungry, that kind of thing. It's going to really, really help you. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm staying on for a bit more to take some other further questions and scroll through and look whether there's anything. I'm, and I just wanted to run through my program. So you probably, you may have seen the slides at the start of the women that managed to reduce belly fat by doing one of my programs. They weren't all on a really expensive program. Some of them were, the, were just on, one of them was just on my six week shred and she got some really great results. And these are the, these are the programs I run. So, you know, maybe you've got your workouts and everything sorted out. You know what you're doing with your strength training. Maybe you've got a PT or you kind of know what you're doing with your strength training and hit. If you feel like you need some help with the diet plan, I, I do actually have, I didn't put on, I've got a free meal plan that you can download as well that's on my website. And I'm going to give the website um, at the end. Um, but yeah, the, um, basically the free, the free meal plan is like a 14 day plan. And then, um, you know, the, the paid for the high protein meal plan. So I'm just trying to get do two things at once, which is always a big mistake for a menopausal woman. The high protein meal plan is it's a customized meal plan. So you kind of have you there are several different options according to what your weight is, what your goal is, and how much activity you're doing. So it's customized to your specific kind of um 
weight or or kind of I suppose your um not it's not just about your weight really body composition that's the word I'm looking for because there's more to it than weight it's kind of body composition and what your goals are and how much activity you're doing so that's a really easy entry point if you're kind of thinking oh I'm really worried and, and I find it really difficult to understand how to get my protein in and it's got like a hundred recipes as well as the meal plan it's got a hundred recipes and it's got video tutorials demonstrating some of the the food the recipes as well and then you've got my six week shred which you know that is really popular program because it it's a home workout challenge really for six weeks and then you get video tutorials on all the exercises the hit workouts to follow along and then the strength training is is a demonstration once only of each exercise and then it's got a meal plan and the meal plan goes with the six week shred and that's extremely popular as well so if you're looking that's for someone you you probably don't want to start with that. And I've actually forgotten to put in here. I do have a beginner strength training program for forty nine dollars as well. And these are just one off payments, by the way. They're not it's not a subscription. They're just one off payments. Um, and you get as soon as you, you you go go online and I'll give you the website address. You can get direct access and start using it. Sorry, I've got some music going in the background there. You can get direct access straight away so you don't kind of have to hang on. You can start using the program immediately, which, you know, that's the wonders of modern technology. So I just put the, the website address in the the chat and then I've got my lean and strong program one of the ladies that was at the start had real success with that and it's a 12-week program that's for people who've had some experience of lifting I'd say three to six months of experience before you join that and that's got a home workout program and it's got a gym workout program and the lady that did it she did it for 12 weeks and saw amazing results in 12 weeks I have to say and it includes the meal plan as well for the 12 weeks so it's pretty comprehensive and then I have the six week coaching program which is you know it's um it's pretty comprehensive it, you know the price is reflected because you're working directly with me so that's why that is that that price, because you're having weekly calls with me. You know, we, we you've got customized, you've got a customized program, a customized workout plan, a customized meal plan. You know, it's the sort of all singing and dancing. So if you feel I know I get contacted a lot by people, it's actually a group coaching program. So if you feel you want to work directly with me and have some interaction with me, then that's the program for you. And then I'm just going to quickly, before I jump onto some more questions, going to talk about my app. So which, this is another way of getting rid of belly fat, really. Um, if you want something that's that's kind of you, you, you've got some accountability as well, which you have if you work with me um, on my coaching program. But this gives you accountability and you have an option with my app of going in, downloading it on Apple and Google Play, and the links are on my website as well, and just looking and, and trying out the seven-day free plan. And that's a non-committal thing. You don't have to sign up to anything to download and use that free seven-day plan. You can just use that, and it's got a meal plan. It's got some examples of some workouts and that kind of thing. And then, you know, if you, you, you sort of think, well, I want something where I'm a bit more accountable and it's got tracking features, it's got different workouts, it's got weekly recipes, it's got customised meal plans, then you, you inside the app you can join my Strong Women Club, which is $49 per month. And th that's a very comprehensive... So you can track your waist measurement. I'm not a big fan of... Um, tracking weight scale weight and then I ch set challenges within the app so it's just a way of um keeping you more motivated there's like 20 minute workouts in there if, if you're tired like we were talking at before you haven't got much time 
there's some 20 minute workouts as well as sort of full workouts 20 minute strength training workouts so I know that sort of appeals to a lot of people getting stuff done in a really short space of time and then if you want something where you like this really where you get weekly live calls with me on on zoom then I've got the strong women in a circle inside the app so that's really got a lot of the same features of the strong women club but you get weekly live calls so you can access all this and I've put the website address in the chat via my website so I kind of got something for everyone really ranging from free <laughs> so if you want to do you want to get something for absolutely free or you want to work really close with me and pay kind of $497 for six weeks you can do that so I've got kind of the whole range of things really so I'm gonna go into questions I, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now if I can do that yeah I can do that and and show um I'll just read through the questions so oh gosh I like this this isn't really a question but it's a great comment about weight loss because the thing about it is the scale can give us it can be demotivating is what I would say the scale you can jump on the scale and you know I do this sometimes when I'm going through my competition journey I had to kind of check in with my coach and give them my scale weight but they don't just measure scale weight they look at pictures and measurements and everything else and, and videos videos of you sort of posing so scale weight is just one one tool that's used but I know with my own body, I can get on the scale scale and two days later I can get on the scale and be like two kilos heavier. That's about five pounds. Now, that's not putting on body fat. There's no way you can put on body fat in two days. That's water. So it can be really, really demotivating, particularly for people. If you're one of these people that gets on the scale every day. I would say just lose the scale. And, and for most people, just losing the scale is really going to help you feel better and, and take your waist measurement. Because we're talking about belly fat. What you'll find is your waist measurement. If you put everything into practice that I've talked about, you know, do the eating, do the exercise, you're going to find your waist measurement goes down quite quickly, quite early depending on what your lifestyle was like before if you've had a pretty clean lifestyle before it might take a bit longer but for most of us your waistline is going to go down once you start paying attention to all this detail particularly your you know what you're eating you're going to find your waist measurement goes down so that's really going to motivate you think wow and then as as um tams is saying her jeans if your jeans you, you're having to get uh, you, they're loose and you have to grab another pair of jeans out of the cupboard that are, you know a smaller size that's a really good indication isn't it and, and pictures are also a really good indication so go on that but don't go on jumping on the scale all the time and not even the body fat percentage on the scale that's way off I, I just completely ignore body fat percentage on the scale and I know women who contacted me saying oh my body fat percentage it's not going down well the only way to know what your body fat percentage is to get a very expensive deck scan and what's the point of that what's that going to tell you it's just not it's not entirely useful and actually you can tell so when I take coaching clients on they don't give me my weight they send in their pictures and I can tell by looking at them what their body composition is I can look at them so it's not about how big or small you are, or how much you weigh on the scale. It's about your body composition. How much muscle have you got versus fat? What's your body composition? And that's like really important. And BMI, again, that's a really useless sort of measurement that now the World Organization Body Mass Index, they're not using it anymore because it was really flawed. It was actually geared towards white males and not females from all, you know, nations. 
So it didn't really work for everybody. So they've ditched that. And actually, the World Health Organization are using waste measurement. Guess what? Waste measurement. Waste to height ratio is what they use. So, you know, really, if you can just use how your clothes feel and that kind of thing, your waist measurement, it's really going to help you feel much more motivated about what your progress is. And progress can come in lots of forms. So when I work with women, one of the things I've noticed that happens is they have more energy. That's progress. They start experiencing less pain that's progress they start getting stronger that's progress so yes we want to look visually a bit better but thinking about those things where we're progressing we're getting stronger maybe we can do a press up or it's called a push up in the USA and you didn't you weren't able to do one before that's progress um so I've just looked at this question about my program. This is a really interesting program, Millie. Millie and Lucas Orlando, I hope you're still there. You look like a fantastic family. What a lovely picture. How impactful will be to the program to sleep four or five hours a night? Well, on some of my programs, I actually give tips about that. So in my app, I've kind of got a video where it guides you through I think there are several things, um, you know, I think you're saying perhaps you only get four to five hours sleep per night. And, you know, if you can try and even get maybe it's an extra half an hour, an extra hour, it's going to really, really help you because it's going to mean you're going to have more energy for working out. And um, working out also kind of helps you sleep better and eating the right food helps you sleep better as well. That's the other thing I didn't mention. So, yeah, if you're sort of it, it's hard for me to know the answer because I think you mean, well, I'm only getting four or five hours of sleep per night. So should I get your program now? And I would say work on your sleep first. I'm not here to kind of make you buy something that isn't going to work for you. If, if sleep's a massive issue for you, address that first. Try and address that first. Then when you've got your energy levels a bit better and you're sleeping, you're getting a better night's sleep. Even if you can move to like you're on five hours, you can get to six hours then you can start to kind of implement some of the other things. So I hope that helps. Right, this is a really good question. How I 40, welcome, welcome to my channel. And thank you very much for asking the question because this is about plateauing and everyone will go through a stage of plateauing. And plateauing means you, you kind of not really got the weight loss going on anymore you're doing the same you were having success and then it sort of stops and you stay at the same weight don't you so what you're saying how i 40 is how can i tell the difference between a temporary plateau and being in maintenance i just need to know when it's the right time to reduce calories slightly so when we plateau i would say when they when you're noticing you know you're, you're kind of on this weight loss thing and it's it's all happening, but you're, you're not, and, and we all will plateau because actually when you start losing weight, you need to be kind of on lower calories. That's the thing. Once your weight goes down, you need lower calories for the weight loss. So that's why a 200 pound woman needs different calories to a 150 pound woman to lose weight. A 200 pound woman can be up on higher calories and lose weight. That's kind of how it works. So there are some things you can do. How to, how to know the difference? Well, if this has been happening for a number of weeks and you're not seeing a shift, you're not seeing a shift in your visually, you're not seeing a shift in the way your clothes fit and you're not seeing a shift in your, you know, your waist measurement, that's a good signal that you're kind of plateauing. And the thing to do, there's two things you can do. 
bring your calories back up to maintenance and go on a diet break. That's actually a really, really good tool. And there's been loads of research that shows this works really well. It's also really good for motivation because sometimes when you're cutting calories and you're in a deficit, it can feel a little bit when you it's been going on for a long time. It's quite nice mentally to have a break from that, isn't it? So there's lots of research to show it actually benefits you physically. So you go on maintenance for, say, two weeks and then you go back to deficit. That's one tool you can use. Or, yes, you can you reduce your calories slightly. So that's the two options that you've got there. But with reducing your calories, you've got to be so careful with this, because when you reduce your calories, you get to the point, don't you, where they're so low that there's nowhere to go. So I would say if you're going to lose, you reduce your calories, you just do things by small margins. It might be 50 calories a day. You just reduce it by that. And it doesn't sound like much, does it? More Small margins. But it's kind of what I do when I'm getting ready for a show. It's not like I'm doing a big calorie cut. It's like just reduce by 50 per day when I'm going through a fat loss phase. You know, it's not extreme margins and that works really, really well. And then your body gets used to that. So it might mean that you've got to kind of adjust it again. But if you keep if you do it by small margins, it means there's always somewhere to go, isn't there? But if you kind of drop it by 300 calories, that's really difficult because once you've done that, where do you go from there? Right. That's a, that, that I'm just looking down for more questions because I'm trying to answer as much as I can. So, yes, this is good because I haven't really covered this in this live. I'm, I'm going to spend I think we've got about nine more minutes and then um, I've reached my plateau because it'll be 9.30 in the evening here at, in the UK. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to spend about nine more minutes and try and get through some of these questions. So Claudia says, hi, Claudia, and thank you so much for joining. It's absolutely fantastic to see you and so many women here. I am 40 and I have been strength training for three years. My problem is I find it hard to eat enough protein. Any suggestions? So, yeah, this is it. It's um, first of all, go and download my free meal plan. I've put the link down in the comments section to my website and the, it's there. You can just click that and download. It's a whole nutrition guide. And then I'm going to just talk about how to get your protein in now. So it's really important to kind of eat protein at every meal. And I'm going to go through some really good sources of protein. So you have got so sort of on the meat, let's cover the meat side of things first. So you've got things like chicken breast. It could be chicken thigh. It could be kind of any lean cuts of meat, pork, beef, lamb. They just need to be quite lean. You know, if you can find stuff that says it's like five percent fat, that's always a good guide. Fish is really good lean fish white fish or oily fish because oily fish is fantastic for balancing our hormones um and sort of shellfish as well is, is great so any of those kind of meat or fish options then on the sort of um vegetarian side of it you've got like eggs eggs absolutely wonderful i'm not a big fan of eating egg whites because i just don't like them I see all these YouTubers and they're people on bikini prep eating egg whites and they kind of have this egg white omelette. And you think, wow, that just looks awful. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a bit of fat. The egg whites have got the, the protein. They're the bit that have got high in protein. Or what you can do is another thing to keep your calories a bit down is put two eggs together with two egg whites, something like that. And you can buy boxes of egg whites but I'm not just a big fan of egg whites on their own they're, they're not too they're not too pleasant really 
Greek yogurt we've talked about, that's really high in protein or any kind of natural yogurt. Try not to buy the ones with the added sort of sugar in and that kind of thing. Add your own fruit in, I would say, is a good idea. Just buy the plain yogurt and, and add your own fruit and sweeten it yourself. Then you've got you kind of got your vegan sources of protein. So you've got tofu, seitan, and then um, that's the, there's that fermented tofu, which I can't think of what what that's called. You've got nutritional yeast. You've got beans. You've got lentils. And then there are kind of some vegetables that are high in protein. So you've got sort of green beans, broccoli, and then some carb sources that are high in protein. So you've got oats, oatmeal, you call it in the USA. And then, you, you know, that's actually high in protein. And you've got sort of quinoa, even rice has protein in it. And another veggie is peas that's high in protein. So it's just really good if you can kind of put protein into all your meals and all your snacks. That's the way to think of it. And if you can kind of think of it like that and also using a protein powder. So you can use a whey protein powder. I don't whey doesn't particularly agree with me and my digestion. So I tend to have a plant protein powder. So you can either have the you know, either of those, those are a really good way. You can either mix it in with food. So I got recipes here on this channel. If you look at my what I eat in a days as well, Claudia, I've got a playlist called what I eat in a day, it will show you all the food you can eat that's high in protein. And once you become used to it, it actually becomes really easy. But adding a protein powder into a drink or into some kind of food I do my own homemade protein and oat bars that kind of thing you you'll find that you'll easily get your protein intake up and you know you don't have to worry so much about the whole one gram of protein for every pound in body weight the reason I say that is just really easy for people to remember if you were getting in 0.8 grams of protein for every pound of body weight that would be absolutely fine and really good and you know maybe what you could do is just gradually start incorporating it and it's really going to help with that so I hope that did help and I'm just going to go for one more comment um, now before I finish off and, and thank you very much for joining um, I'm just scrolling down now to see, sorry. So this is um, Livia Olivares. Hello, Livia. Thank you very much for joining and thank you for the question. Hello, I've been training for a long time now, but recently I gained weight due to hormone imbalance. Can I lose weight and change my body? Absolutely, you can. It may be that you, you, you know, you may need to sort of change what you're doing if it's not working. So I don't know what you're doing in terms of training. And did you see the earlier slide where I talked about the training, which is strength training, high intensity interval training, getting your steps in? And then are you really dialing in on that nutrition? This is what makes a massive difference when we're older. We, we just didn't need to worry about that when we were younger. I never ate like this when I was younger and I didn't need to concern myself with it. And now I do. And that's getting this high protein in, really dialing in on the nutrition. So you're understanding you're within a certain calorie limit and it doesn't have to be really, really low. You know, we're talking about for most people, it's probably going to be over 1500 calories or more up to depending on what your weight is up to over 2000 calories for some people on on weight loss. But it's about really dialing in on that nutrition, getting in 30, around about 35 percent protein, 35 percent carbs and 30 percent fats. Now, you can play around with those percentages a little bit. Get Take 5%. If you love fats, 
take 5% out of the carbs and put it into the fats instead. So you have 35% fats. But it's kind of around a third of each. That's what's going to really work and help. You know, that's what makes a big difference when we can really dial in on that, that nutrition. And it doesn't mean going really low on calories and starving yourself. Because that actually has the, the opposite effect of what we want. Because we don't then have good metabolism. If we go really low on calories, it impacts on our metabolism. So I hope that helps, Livia. And do watch back from the start if you've missed it do watch the recording and I'm going to sign off there and just say to you guys thank you so much for joining look out for more lives coming your way this year I'm definitely going to be doing some more because I do love doing that and I do love connecting with you and it's absolutely fantastic and have a great great weekend and I love you all and see you all very, very soon. Thank you so much.